Now, in my vast experience with life living, I've learned one important thing. Poverty doesn't pay the bills, but killing does. The samurai in today's video also learned this lesson. When studying history, we're like an eagle in the sky, looking down at big events and societal changes. But spend all your time looking at forests, and you will miss the trees. Spend all your time on Tinder, and you'll miss the best friend who's always been there waiting for you. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to see how individual people lived inside the forest of history. Today we follow the life of a badass samurai who fought in the Mongol invasions of Japan and his quest to get the rewards he deserved for defending his country. The only reason we know about this dude was because his ego was as big as his testosterone-packed balls. He commissioned an artist to make these illustrated scrolls of his deeds in battle, because the world had a hole that could only have been filled by the story of his life. If Instagram existed, he'd be on it every day, posting workout pics behind motivational misquotes. This samurai was a hero to Japan for helping to fight off foreign invaders, and a hero to Japanese historians for helping their careers, because much of what we know about the Mongol invasions came from these scrolls. Our hero's name was Takezaki Suenaga, and like most anime protagonists, he came from humble beginnings. Suenaga was a minor member of his clan. A land dispute took away what little land he owned, and his future seemed a bit absolutely doomed. Fortunately, one day Suenaga was blessed with a joyous event. The Mongols invaded in 1274. Nothing spells opportunity like foreigners coming to slaughter your people. Suenaga filled his luggage with the essentials, a set of armor, a bow, some arrows, and four men. Then he set off for glory. He arrived at the battlefield ready to kick ass and chew bubblegum, and bubblegum wasn't invented yet. Having four followers with you was pretty common. Most warriors who answered the call to arms had only a handful of followers. But there were a few samurai who brought more than a hundred men with them. Our hero saw these rock star samurai strutting around, swinging their balls at passersby, and his heart dropped. How was he going to stand out with his tiny balls among all these warriors? Suenaga reported to his assigned unit, where some young almond milk drinking commander told them that the terrain ahead was bad for fighting on horseback and ordered them to stay and wait for the enemy. Suenaga thought this was a smart and safe strategy for little girls. No, he had a better strategy. The notice me commander strategy. Suenaga and his men disobeyed orders and rode towards the enemy, determined to be the first from their province to spill Mongol blood. It seems crazy that he could ignore orders like that, but this was pretty common. He was doing what all honorable samurai did in war. Disregard everything in the singular pursuit of profit. Japan didn't have a national army. Samurai were like independent contractors who fought for rewards, which they got by doing badass things in battle, like collecting heads. It wasn't uncommon for people to toss aside orders to pursue the hobby of head collecting instead. One of Suenaga's servants urged him to wait for reinforcements, because a witness was required for claiming rewards. Instead, Suenaga yelled, The way of the bow and arrow is to do what is worthy of reward! Charge! It was a terrible idea. It was raining arrows and they didn't have umbrellas. Everyone got hit, including his poor bannerman, who was this dude who just ran around carrying Suenaga's banner. Interns get the worst jobs. As they lay on the ground, wondering why they brought a guy whose only job was to hold a big target above their heads, one of the Chad samurai, who led a hundred men, came to their rescue. Afterwards, he agreed to be a witness to Suenaga's bravery, and Suenaga agreed to be his. Later, Suenaga saw this other samurai take an arrow to the neck bone, get up, then ask Suenaga to be his witness. He agreed. The battlefield was full of warriors going, Hey, did you see the cool shit I did? Again, their main concern was rewards, not something dumb like defending the country. After the battle, Suenaga's deeds were recorded. The path to getting rewarded for military service went like this. Suenaga's commander was supposed to send the shogunate a recommendation for rewards. The shogunate would investigate the claim, maybe summon some witnesses in case Suenaga was a dirty liar, then grant him land or something, along with a letter saying, Thanks for saving our asses from those Asian bearded Legolasses. Unfortunately, for some reason, his recommendation never reached the government. 
Suenaga got pissed off and decided to travel to the shogunate in Kamakura to plead his case. Remember, for all he knew, the Mongols could have been on the way for another invasion, and he should have stayed put in case he was needed. But that didn't matter, he wanted his payday. Now, Suenaga was here, and Kamakura was here. It was a two-month trip, and he was a two-bit samurai. He couldn't afford it. Money didn't grow on trees, okay? It grew on plants. Rice plants. In hard times, you can always count on family, he thought. So he asked a clan elder for traveling money. The elder listened to Suenaga boast about how he bravely fell in battle after not laying a scratch on the enemy. It was convincing, but in the end, the elder refused. He said it was a bad idea because the shogunate might soon ban warriors from traveling east because they needed people in Kyushu in case another invasion came. Likely excuse, old Japanese man. Like I always said, you can never count on family, Suenaga thought. And so he made a gamble. He gritted his teeth, squeezed his balls, and made the decision to sell his horses to raise money for the trip. This was a big deal. A samurai was nothing without a horse. A horse was like a computer to a PC gamer, or Reddit to an incel. Suenaga was going all in on the poker table of life. If the shogunate refused to hear his case, he vowed to become a Buddhist priest and never return. In 1275, Suenaga began his journey. The sad thing was that no clan member saw him off. His clan leader must have disapproved. He stopped by shrines on the way and prayed for the gods to grant him his sweet rewards. He arrived at Kamakura two months later and immediately visited temples and shrines to pray. And the gods said, okay, okay, we get it. But nothing comes easy. Suenaga tried to meet with a government official, but he looked like some horseless nobody, so they ignored him. It took two months of being a Karen to everyone for him to finally score a meeting. Suenaga even knew someone high up in the shogunate, and it still took two months. Warriors with no connections must have had no chance at all. He met with the man in charge of rewards, Adachi Yasumori, who also happened to be his province's military governor. It could have been Suenaga's goal all along to talk directly with his military governor. Yasumori was skeptical. Do you have an enemy head? Yasumori asked. No, said Suenaga. Did your men die in battle? No. Did you die in battle? No. Then you don't get a reward. Bish. But Suenaga didn't give up. He didn't come all the way from irrelevant Japan just to get shut down in one meeting. He argued that he was wounded in battle, that he was the first from his province to charge in, and that he was shamed when his brave deeds were not reported. He also mentioned that his main concern was not the reward, of course. He had but one wish, for the shogun to know of his brave service, because it would encourage him in case there came another invasion. Persistence beats resistance. Yasumori said fine, and gave Suenaga a plot of land and also threw in a powerful horse as a bonus. Suenaga was as happy as a kid on Christmas Day who got a horse. He thought it was the greatest honor a warrior could get. Suenaga felt more loyalty to Yasumori than he did to his own clan. In his scrolls, Suenaga reminded his descendants to remember and honor Arachi Yasumori. This shifting of loyalties happened a lot in those days after the Mongol invasions. Suenaga was one of the lucky ones. The shogunate was slow in granting rewards. For the second invasion, the shogunate only started granting rewards five years after the invasion, and it dragged on for years. Many samurai got little tiny bite-sized pieces of land, or no land at all. When the Mongols decided to come and embarrass themselves a second time in 1281, Suenaga took a few men and again charged blindly into the battlefield like an angry lemming. Problem was, the Mongols were stuck at sea, and Suenaga didn't have a boat. He couldn't fight on a boat, he couldn't fight with a goat. You can see how haphazard the Japanese defense was at the time. So, Suenaga went boat hunting. He jumped onto another group's boat and had to jump off after they were like, dude, get off our boat. He found another group, and this time claimed to be a famous warrior of the shogunate. Small lies pave the way to big accomplishments. This second group agreed, but wondered why such a famous warrior didn't have a boat. They only let him on, though, not his followers. Suenaga didn't care. He left his followers behind. He was out for glory. While at sea, Suenaga realized he had forgotten his helmet. 
A lesser man would have demanded to have someone else's helmet, but Suenaga eats lesser men for breakfast. He found two shin guards lying on the boat and tied them to his head. Nothing would block his path to glory. In the battlefield, Suenaga went bananas. He spent the battle jumping onto enemy ships and slaughtering people. He would tell the enemy to surrender if they wanted to live, then kill them after they surrendered. Friends and foes alike were amazed at seeing this angry lemming jumping from boat to boat, kicking ass and not chewing bubblegum. After the battle, the commander called him the baddest man around. Suenaga did collect some heads this time, and again journeyed to Kamakura, this time claiming a reward was a breeze. In 1293, Takezaki Suenaga commissioned an artist to create two scrolls of his military deeds, and historians rejoiced. Alright, today's quiz question is this. If an ubame hands you its baby, the baby may become very heavy by turning into what? Answer in the comments. I'll pick a winner from among the correct answers tomorrow. Winner gets one of these. Good luck. For more Mongol invasion videos, check these out. Okay, I want to thank some new patrons today. Akinobu, Fleur, Teresa Ramos, TX Biker, Texas Biker, Brooke Gillespie, and Alexander Petrovnia. All right, I love you and spread the knowledge.